Well, uh, welcome uh, everybody to um, to this um, uh, latest seminar in the uh, series on Bentham and the fine arts. It's a great pleasure to uh, introduce um, Professor Francis um, Ferguson, who has come to us from the University of Chicago to address um, um, the topic which he's going to speak about this evening. Um, Professor Ferguson is um, is one of these ex exceptional. Um, polymathic scholars who, um, who actually, uh, uh, through her work, justifies the principle of interdisciplinary study. And um, it, therefore, what, what she will have to say will surprise us in its novelty and originality, but for those of us who have read her will not be surprised by its uh, breadth. So I just welcome you to London and to the, the home of Jerry Bentham. Um, uh, allow me to welcome you on his behalf. Uh, he continues to be a spectral but living presence <laughs> in this institution, and we celebrate and honour him by critical engagement with his work every day. And uh, we're very grateful that you're contributing to that effort. So, please. Thank you very much. Um, I'm um, very grateful uh, to um, Anthony Julius and Malcolm Quinn and Philip Schofield for having issued this invitation to me, and particularly grateful to them for having introduced me mm. to Bentham's writings on sexual morality, which are writings I was only um, uh, uh, aware of to a very minimal degree. Uh, so it's been a completely illuminating experience to work um, on the paper for this seminar. What I should say is that um, as I reread the um, mandate that we were all given um, and read that the idea was that we were supposed to talk about the way in which Benthamite <coughs> utilitarianism with its emphasis on pain and pleasure um, was really at odds with um, it, aesthetics as we customarily understand it. And I think that that's true so long as one leaves out of account the particular text that, uh, of Bentham's that we're um, looking at today, the ones on sexual morality. Um, because it seems to me that what Bentham is really doing in those texts is to produce a, a very expansive account of what aesthetic experience is. Um, and that he's, he's really making a strong claim that we shouldn't just focus aesthetics on the sensuous, but should see the sensuous as including all the senses. And uh, as you're all probably aware, one of the things he's doing quite remarkably um, in these texts is to talk about the sixth sense as sextus, the sexual sense. Um, what I should also say by way of introduction is that one of the things that I try to do in this paper is to talk some about Kant just to set up the ways in which Kant's writings on aesthetics represent a strong contrast with Bentham. And I must say that though I've long <coughs> thought of myself as someone who had a lot of time for Kant, Bentham has made me feel that I have less time for him now <laughs> than I once did. To explain the pleasure that people take in representations, Kant's critique of the power of judgment has provided one account of aesthetic experience so strong as to have obscured the importance of Bentham's contributions to aesthetic thought. For example, it was once so customary for literary critics and historians to cite Bentham's remark that pushpin might sometimes occasion as much pleasure as poetry that they never bothered to read further. They simply moved to identify Bentham as a <coughs> utilitarian, to dim dismiss utilitarianism as the crassest possible focused on, focus on ends, and to suggest that there was no need to look for illumination on anything like aesthetic pleasure in his work. Kant, by contrast, offered up an account of aesthetics that conspicuously minimized the importance of immediate advantage and purpose. He made the look of purposiveness the very mark of the self-transcendence that aesthetic experience might afford. <coughs> 
He centered his discussion on our appreciation of natural beauty and the difficulty we have explaining it if we don't have the reasons of the landscape gardener or the forester. He thus distinguished purposiveness from purposes, in his famous phrase, purposiveness without purpose, and treated the pleasure that we take in representations as a symptom of individual human freedom. When we find this tree or that flower beautiful, our pleasure is disinterested and entirely unforced by others and even by a distinct purpose in the Kantian view. And when we realize that we take pleasure in green, though our friends like blue, Kant would say that we see further evidence that aesthetic judgment is symptomatic of freedom. We like what we like from a first personal perspective. Aesthetic judgment is insistently first personal. We as aesthetic individuals like what we like. We don't like it because someone else does. And this first personal basis allows Kant to frame aesthetic judgment as a distinct counter to the kind of imitativeness that he associates with the unfreedom of childhood. Indeed, autonomy is so central a notion for Kant that children become his example of the difference between a mere imitation of someone else's taste and aesthetic judgment that actually deserves the name. Aesthetic judgment for Kant involves not just an expression of individual freedom. In the process of freeing an individual from recognizing an object exclusively in terms of its purpose, what it's supposed to be, Acts of aesthetic judgment in Kant reveal both the subjective element of the experience of beauty for a perceiver and catch objects up in the allure that results from the activity of the subject in lingering over the consideration of the beautiful because this consideration strengthens and reproduces itself. Here I'm simply rehearsing some of the most basic elements of Kantian aesthetic doctrine as he lays it out in the third and last of his three crit critiques. Most starkly put, the three different critiques identify three different stages of freedom or subjectivity. In the critique of pure reason, Kant describes how our perceptions of physical objects in the world are determined by the existence of those objects. And although he takes human faculties of representation to fall short of capturing the thing in itself, judgments of the understanding come as close to being objective as he thinks it's possible to be. In the critique of the power of judgment, the pleasure in the perception operates in advance of and independence of any cognition of the object, so, so that aesthetic judgment escapes from the trammels of the determining judgments that pure reason makes. And finally, the critique of practical reason establishes moral judgment as the supreme expression of individual autonomy, the supersensible attribute of the subject, in other words, freedom. The three Kantian critiques, insofar as they try to isolate three different ways that humans have for operating in the world, identify the conditions of possibility for cognitive, aesthetic, and moral judgments. But because they aim to distinguish the various relations to experience, the examples, particularly for the aesthetic judgment, betray their origin in what we might think of as laboratory conditions. On the one hand, we might imagine that the critique of the power of judgment rightly treats all its examples as provisional, mere ways of gesturing toward the basic lines of argument. On the other, the observations for living that Kant offered his students in the lectures on anthropology that he delivered between 1772 and 1796 continually take up examples of pleasure and displeasure in social conduct that sit uneasily with the position he lays out in the critique of the power of judgment. The anthropological lectures describe and rationalize social roles and modes of behavior. The critique provides a tortuous path for human sociability. For even though Kant maintains that we only decorate our houses out of a sense of sociability, he also insists that our aesthetic judgments don't arise or shouldn't arise from imitating others. The philosopher Paul Geyer has suggested friendly amendments to Kant's account of the individualized sociality of, in, of aesthetic judgments, even as the sociologist Pierre Bourdieu has simply opposed Kant's position and insisted that aesthetic judgments are so thoroughly social and so socially imitative acts that they can be used to diagnose class positions. But neither <coughs> of them addresses a worry I've developed largely as a result of reading Bentham's sexual irregularities and not Paul but Jesus. 
the examples in the critique of the power of judgment are designed to distinguish aesthetic experience from mere recognition of both an object, that's an oak, and of someone else's aesthetic experience, she likes oaks. They thus depict the possibility of individuals acknowledging something new to the world, whether for oneself alone or for presentation to others. This is the aspect of Kant's attack on imitativeness that has convincingly led to the kind of interest in language games and conversations that proceed by someone saying something, being understood, and being replied to, not with a repetition of the same words, but with statements that are themselves new. We don't need an example from someone else, um, he thinks, to take pleasure in natural beauty. But the claim to universal communicability operates in a surprising way. This is the claim that we hold firm to our evaluations of aesthetic objects and insist that they are shareable even if others do not share them. This is a position that Kant lays out as a generalization from experience rather than a mere conjecture. While the inability to ground aesthetic judgments in distinct acts of cognition might make them look comparatively unwilling to take their stand, it makes them paradoxically more assertive than acts of understanding. The rather surprising result of Kant's line of argument about communicability is that taste considered in relation to the physical senses is more pluralistic than aesthetic judgments, as Kant describes them. Taste as a sensory statement is definite, but not necessarily universalizable. Someone tasting cilantro can readily pronounce it to be a pleasant herb or an herb that tastes like soap. Someone who is colorblind may not see red or green where I do, but they do see some color, some something, though it may cover a range of about five different colors that um, many of us see. We may label this a mild disability not to experience the taste of cilantro as pleasant and not to see color as most people see it, but we don't require every individual to uphold our commonest statements about either one of these things. Aesthetic judgment as Kant presents it is, however, more militant. It has a certain intransigence and intractability while it can seem accom accommodative in yielding up claims to rational explanation and suasion, I'm suggesting that we can hear in Kant something like the snarl with which Wordsworth says in the preface to Lyrical Ballads that he doesn't imagine that he can reason his readers into an appreciation for the kind of poetry he's offering them. Kant tends to present any concessiveness about the first personal aesthetic judgment as appropriate only in the future as an acknowledgment of one's future self. In the kind of example that will be repeated in lionizing literary biographies, Kant presents the artist as someone heroic enough to maintain his poetic convictions <clears throat> in the face of his friend's disparagements until he finally revisits his opinion some years later. Now, what I mean to stress about Kant's account of aesthetic judgment as he lays it out in the critique of the power of judgment in 1790 and in the lectures on anthropology is its emphasis on the importance of an individual's trusting herself. The anthropological account stages itself as a discussion of persons who are <coughs> social persons, and in that sense, it values the social exchange of observations about the beautiful between persons. Thus, he can affirm that taste is a faculty of making social judgments of external objects within the power of imagination, and that taste concerns the communication of our feeling of pleasure and displeasure to others, and includes a susceptibility which this very communication affects pleasurably, to feel a satisfaction about it in common with others, sociably. In the critique, this appeal to the common and communicable appears with the greatest intensity in the discussion of a common sense. There he maintains that even though we are grounding our judgment only on our feeling, we treat that feeling not as a private feeling, but as a common one. We, in other words, perform acts of aesthetic judgment as ourselves, but also as exemplars. <coughs> we can thus see ourselves as exemplifying humanity in our own persons, as he says in his discussion of the sublime. 
But what I mean to emphasize here is that in this line of argument develops something of a one-way street for the communicability of aesthetic judgment. Kant makes it clear that he thinks aesthetic judgments can count on being accepted, but at the same time he thinks that the experience of non-confirmation does not undermine the experience of conviction. And I'm going to quote here, now this common sense cannot be grounded on experience for this purpose, for it is to justify judgments that contain a should. It does not say that everyone will concur with our judgment, but that everyone should agree with it. Through something very much like a grammatical sleight of hand, Kant, by moving from the first person singular to the first person plural, makes individual aesthetic judgments look as though they have a claim on other people, even when their assent isn't forthcoming. But both the critique and the lectures on anthropology continually warn us against being taken in by pleasures that others put on offer. We rightly cease, he says, to take pleasure in the song of a bird, when we realize that a young boy made that sound, so, sound and not a nightingale. And we should distance ourselves from the fashionable because it appeals to a compulsion to let ourselves be led slavishly by the mere example that many in society give us. Kant's emphasis on the centrality of individual judgment in aesthetics and in morality has produced a legacy of important restatements and extensions of his first personal stance. Nora O'Neill, for instance, offers a powerful and powerfully Kantian treatment of the issue of trust in the lecture she presented several years ago on the BBC. There she essentially argued against Im imagining that external standards, benchmarks, and supervision could generate trust. Ultimately, trust arises from an individual's requiring herself to be trustworthy and thus inspiring others to be so as well. For Ludwig Wittgenstein and many of his commentators, the problem of pain assumes serious proportions, pain being indubitable from the first person perspective, but an opening on skepticism when someone else tells you about it. When I have a headache, I know I do. When you have a headache, I may wonder how bad it is and even whether you're simply producing an excuse that rests only on your testimony and is both unimpeachable, unimpeachable and open to doubt. Trusting others becomes, for some Kantians, a moral obligation to recognize those persons and their first person personal exemplarity of humanity. In the lectures on anthropology, Kant offers numerous observations on pain and pleasure, which he's seeing very much in terms of a general account of aesthetics. But by making pain internal to human nature, he makes it ineliminable and even fortunate. It's merely a stage on the road to pleasure and productivity. As an incentive to act, inact, sorry, as an incentive to activity, he says, nature has put pain in the human being that he cannot escape from. But Kant doesn't merely make statements about the way that nature has arranged us as individuals. He also notices how we notice other people's pain. It is, he says, not exactly the nicest observation about human beings that their enjoyment increases through comparison with others' pain. And he focuses on cases that involve mixtures of pain and pleasure. An object such as the death of a woman's husband can be unpleasant, but the pain the grieving widow feels concerning it pleasing. With remarks like the ones I've quoted, Kant seems to be replying in advance to Bentham's insistence on holding up Epicurus as the truest philosopher. Using pleasure and pain as the measure of human conduct, Kant seems almost to be saying, is impractical because pleasure and pain are so intimately interconnected. But at the beginning of his lectures on anthropology, he also seems to be anticipating a criticism of his first personal position and attempting to distinguish it from egoism. He relieves himself of an obligation to connect his metaphysics to his remarks and insists that anthropology concerns thinking in which one is not concerned with oneself as the whole world, but rather regards and conducts oneself as a mere citizen of the world. The human being may, from the day he, as he says, begins to speak by means of the I, bring his beloved self to light, if ego is, egoism is allowed to progress unchecked. 
and appeals to other people, make it possible for him to imagine himself or for anyone to imagine themselves as mistaken. One avoids logical egoism, the egoism of the understanding, whenever one checks with others about the testimony of one's own senses to ask, say, whether experiencing a room as hot is just me. One avoids aesthetic egoism by recognizing that he deprives himself of progress by isolating himself with his own judgments and not listening to the appraisals of others. And he objects to what he identifies as eudaimonism in which a moral egoist limits all ends to himself and prefers utility to duty. This tendentious equation between moral egoism and utility may have set the tone for much of the criticism of Benthamite utilitarianism as a philosophy that always begins from number one. But I think that Bentham's writings on sexual irregularities provide a stronger statement than Kant does about other people's pleasure. On the one hand, Kant produces a variety of observations on human conduct to show how we judge it in a fashion that suggests how far he himself is from sorting the aesthetic from the understanding and the reason. On the other, he's driven to wry remarks about why we believe reports from others. It is, he says, so certain that we cannot dispense with newspapers as a means of assuring ourselves of the truth of our judgment that this may be the more, most important reason why learned people cry out so urgently for freedom of the press. It's a great line. We value reports particularly, and perhaps, he suggests, almost only when they confirm us in the judgments we already have. Such a statement for all its wry distancing tends to collapse the lines of distinction among various different kinds of judgment, even as the critique of the power of judgment has isolated them to suggest how aesthetic judgment imposes certain limits on itself. Ralph Mirbot has made an accurate and trenchant statement on Kantian reflective judgment in the critique in saying, in the act sense, reflective judgment is mere reflecting. This is as much as to say aesthetic judgments don't amount to acts because they don't do anything in the <coughs> world. But confining aesthetics to reflection that never enters the field of action is a limitation that shackles Kant's account of anthropology, which sounds like a series of statements about the social world that individual observers might make, and thus much like a conduct book with various urbane rules of thumb that might be used as a guide to living or so Kant thought. Kant's anthropology honors the attention we accord to the objects of our perception and the people we encounter, but it doesn't offer much in the way of what Nicholas Luhmann calls second, second order observation, a way of observing how individual observations interact with public social and legal systems. I've said as much as I have about Kant to prepare the way for explicit and implicit distinctions between his aesthetics and Bentham's, but I also want to underscore one crucial feature of the era that Kant and Bentham shared. What is often seen as a generalized movement toward democracy does not arise specifically in relation to discussions of government in the 18th and early 19th centuries. Accounts that emphasize the rise of democratic feeling can suggest that the right to express one's opinion emerged as a way of recognizing an extension of rights that developed through a series of abstract arguments about rights and through those uh, arguments alone. What I want to propose instead is that such things as the extension of the franchise ultimately acknowledge the fact that a broader and broader segment of the population was being called upon to notice features of their world and the people in it. More and more people were authorized, encouraged, and even pressured to pay attention, to observe. To, to some extent, I'm describing the knock-on effects of the printing press, as Bentham, William Godwin, and Joseph Priestley all describe it. But I also mean to point to the importance of the rise of intellectual domains such as anthropology, as a science of the observations of persons in their societies, and aesthetics as a philosophy concerned with the modes of our observing. <clears throat> 
And those intellectual products, momentous as they are, are in their way slight by comparison with the importance of the rise of the newspaper and the rise of the novel. For daily newspapers and regular periodical publications don't just deliver information to us. They, in their variety, both convince us of the rightness and the freedom of our views, as Kant rightly said, and also constitute a demand that we noticed that we pay attention to the world and inform ourselves of the ways in which the circumstances it offers are continually being updated. Basically, I'm saying that addiction to Facebook is not an entirely new phenomenon. And novels commit their characters so thoroughly to the project of observing others that they can, as in Jane Austen, make their plots out of the observations we rightly call gossip and the occasional observational correction that a novelistic plot can deliver. Catherine Moreland of Northanger Abbey may be mistaken in thinking that General Tilney must, have, Tilney must have murdered his wife because her rooms remain unvisited and Tilney no longer seems in mourning many years after her death. But the novel insistently asserts that she may have been wrong in her observations, but she has not been wrong to observe. Everyone observes. And Austin puts it this way, every man is surrounded by a neighborhood of voluntary spies, and roads and newspapers lay everything open. Um, this is um, when Catherine is being corrected for her wild imaginings. Uh, it's a, a criticism of the extravagance of her imagination that Ian McEwan picks up and uses it as an epigraph for atonement, quite rightly. Austin's novel points an accusatory finger at novels that have worked up Catherine's imagination. But a wider target here is the pleasure people take in having opinions and sharing opinions, most often about <coughs> other people, and especially in feeling that they know other people better than others do, and even better than those other people know themselves. The distinctive fictional device known as free and direct style or free and direct discourse captures this issue. Persons in society are continually in the position of talking to one another, having something to say if only by way of rehearsing every news item they've read that day. Free and direct style in which a narrator seems to merge with the inner thoughts of the character participates, however, in an activity of overknowing, analogous to the way we overknow political figures or anyone else who counts for us as a public personage. The, this is the kind of overknowing that makes me think that I know exactly how virtuous and how vicious Donald Trump is. This phenomenon of overknowing, feeling certainty about things well past uh, any evidence provided by what one can plausibly claim to know, is I think the issue that Bentham is getting at when he insists in what HLA Hart describes as a dangerously ambiguous phrase that that to which expression is given in language, that of which communication is made, is always the man's opinion, nor anything more. Hart may be right to say that it may even be true that human discourse could not function as it does unless there is a generally, though not universally, respected convention that we do not say what we do not believe. I think, however, that Bentham's point is the one that Nicholas Luhmann has foregrounded in saying that whatever we know about our society or indeed about the world in which we live, we know through the mass media. And the mass media here stand in for all communication that revolves around reports, the communications that we take as reliable even though we haven't proved them for ourselves. These are communications such as those of novels and of newspapers, law and literary works that interpose themselves between persons and effectively disrupt the purchase of any conventions of face-to-face -face interactions that would lead us to believe that we usually say only what we believe and usually believe what others say to us when we're in their company. The ultimate burden that Bentham imposes on himself in of sexual irregularities is an argument in favor of the decriminalization of male-male sexuality. 
It's a particularly important feature of this work that he operates with an expansive understanding of aesthetic experience <coughs> that includes both sensory experience and the social and dissocial judgments that attend any one's sexual choices. Nor does it rally men who have sex with men to become an identity group. Although Bentham seems to have imagined that William Beckford, who had been banished to the continent for his sexual encounters with young men, might have been willing to edit the volume, the work is not a call to action on the part of men who have sex with other men. Nor does it suggest that persons should be allowed their sexual pleasures so long as they keep them out of view of the general public and closet themselves or take themselves off to a more tolerant continent. Instead, Bentham argues in the face of a daunting consciousness of the opprobrium that his arguments will receive, that it is not the homosexual but the law that must justify itself. It belongs to any man in power who marks out for punishment anyone who engages in um, irregular sex to show cause why he has done so and to demonstrate that the effect and tendency of the practice is productive not only of mischief, but of a net balance on the side of mischief. Bentham's position here affects an astonishing reversal. He, on the one hand, recognizes that male-male sexuality is so widely scorned and criminalized in English society that popular judgments on it move with the kind of instantaneity that Kant associated with judgments of natural beauty. For him, there's no disputing about taste is a phrase that doesn't translate into a statement of every individual's freedom to maintain their aesthetic judgments in the absence of social confirmation. For him, judgments of taste are merely evaluations that we happen not to dispute, that we decide not to bother to disagree about. Bentham's aim is to lay out a series of observations that would change judgments that seem to go without saying, continually affirmed as they are by both the legal code and the pronouncements of judges and news reports. He recognizes that the senses are legislative within an individual in that one experience of pleasure recommends further experiences of that kind in what Hume called habit and what later analysts would describe as sexual identity or sexual orientation. At the same time, however, they never develop the relative imperviousness to social opinion that Kant claims for aesthetic judgment. Judgments of taste for Bentham uh, are for Bentham cumulative within the individual and socially cumulative as well, not merely communicable, but communicated. Recognition of such cumulative judgments leaves Bentham to adopt a striking way of depic depicting principles <coughs> in argument. Whereas contemporaries such as Joseph Priestley urge that orators inculcate belief and opinion in others by doing such things as putting their own beliefs on display and wrecking them in, in, with manifest sincerity as they affirm them, Bentham does not lay out his own thinking as a direct address to an audience, either specific individuals such as legislatures or members of the public at large. Instead, he depicts principles, stipulations, and definitions. And principles here are analogous to theorems and geometry that one can invoke instead of representing in a proof in its lengthiest form. Uh, <clears throat> Um, stipulations in law similarly make it possible for opposing parties to skip over a certain amount of proof and to accept certain facts without fighting them out. And def definitions can limit the scope of a debate. All of these are accelerants that individual judgments derive from culture. In judgments of sex, the principle of antipathy or principle of asceticism these are Bentham's terms, has, Bentham thinks, established itself so firmly that most people never pause to ask why they confidently pronounce anyone else's sexual experience disgusting. Appealing to his own theorem, the greatest happiness or least misery principle, the principle of utility, he seeks to uncover the pleasures and the pains associated with the sex of individuals and the society in which they live. <coughs> 
Bentham's insight is to see that one may not, may not be able to talk anyone out of their tastes in art or sex, but that one can treat the written cultural record as evidence of positive pleasures. On any occasion when one pronounces the very idea of someone else's way of taking pleasure a cause for disgust, one is underwriting a legal system that makes difference of taste punishable. The affection of antipathy, <coughs> Bentham says, has the property to seek its gratification in the pleasure of subjecting to pain the person by whose conduct the dissocial affection has been excited. And Bentham's contribution, in alignment with his lifelong practice, to the discussion of the social behavior of individuals is to insist that the law as it stands should be put under ob obligation, should justify itself by something other than the claim to be natural and customary. The repeated use of an inflammatory word such as unnatural should not be allowed to stand for an unalterable cultural and legal edict. Instead, those who propose punishment should show that particular acts are crimes and therefore need to be censured. Of sexual irregularities and not Paul but Jesus are documents that speak to their moment, even though the first was published under a pseudonym and volume three of the latter has only appeared posthumously. But they provide a model for thinking about how one might alter opinion on this or any subject. They don't attempt to counter prevailing opinion simply by affirming a different opinion or to win their way with satire. Occasional brilliant turns of phrase remind us that Bentham was the author of, as the author of the book of fallacies, <coughs> could produce accounts as satirical as Flaubert's in his dictionary of received ideas. But Bentham, in of sexual irregularities and not Paul but Jesus, offers long form descriptions that accord serious respect to the positions of those who oppose his views. He commits himself to understanding aesthetics and taste as judgments of pleasure and pain or the absence of pleasure. And he similarly commits himself to observing the work that dislogistic words such as unnatural do in condensing a judgment and picking out sundry occasions for deploying it. Infanticide and rebellion may not have much in common and indeed might seem opposed to one another but the dislogistic work of the epithet unnatural pulls them together. Now I'll leave to the side Bentham's elucidation of the work of the senses, except to observe the obvious importance of his decision to represent sex as the sixth sense, and to note its intensity by comparison with the five senses that are conventionally named. Bentham's exploration of the testimony of the various senses and his comprehensive iteration of the various possible combinations of sex acts, as important as they are, are chiefly, chiefly significant for setting up the question, why does anyone think that sex between men is disgusting? His analysis of the immediate and longer term effects of male-male sexuality makes it hard to see why pleasure-giving acts should be censured, indeed punished as capital crimes, when his analysis acquits them of doing damage to individuals, such as women who might conceivably suffer neglect or to society at large, which might claim to be injured by non-procreative sex were it not for Thomas Malthus's demonstration and Bentham's own that society has more to fear from redundant population rather than from a low birth rate. The centerpiece of Bentham's discussion is what turns out to be a history of the principle of aestheticism. When Kant presents various kinds of aesthetic objects as examples of objects that elicit positive judgments of pleasure, he focuses on the possibilities that those objects offer for aesthetic judgments in the present. Attention falls so directly on the judgment being passed on the beauty of an object that its content becomes nearly irrelevant. A beautiful object, whether painting or poem, does little service to disclose the judgments of the characters depicted within its precincts. Bentham, by contrast, consults an historical literary record, materials and writing that fall on both sides of the distinction we now draw between the historical and the literary. He names both actual and le legendary characters less to anatomize their writings and their exploits 
than to observe that they believed that sex acts between men were pleasurable and desirable, and that their society considered this judgment not to disqualify them for renown and to be regarded as heroes of various kinds. Socrates was, he writes, represented, if not as a model of perfect virtue, as a model of the most perfect virtue that heathenism admitted of. Virgil Shepherd Corridon, with his love laments for Alexis and the courageous Theban band um, in the second case, all mark out love operating in this irregular shape and mark it as pious, a noble emotion. As Bentham observes, in a case such as this, fiction in its nature affords more conclusive evidence than any particular realities. It shows the conclusion drawn by opinion from universal and continual experience. Bentham's compelling point here is that literature is evidence of judgments of taste that needed no apologies in their own time. It testifies to behavior that is not simply innoxious, but positively beneficial, and never performed unless attended with pleasure. The eulogistic aims of love poetry and tales of heroes bespeak a taste that never imagines that it will be judged harshly by posterity. In that global sense, it underscores the convictions of the heart's affections. In this regard, it provides an amendment to and an improvement on John Stuart Mill's distinction between <coughs> oratory that is heard and poetry that's overheard. I'm suggesting that ancient literature and history is for us uh, overheard. Literature testifies to feelings that need not seek for any further justification in that they carry conviction within them. It was a thought that various writers had as they were trying to free literature from absorption in its own history and convention. And it was a thought that Wordsworth clearly had a couple of decades earlier when he pronounced that poetry is the history or science of feeling and that Anna Letitia Barbold had when she declared that novels testify to individual and social judgments in their time and do so more accurately than laws and much more accurately than the judgments of posterity do. Bentham's point then in extending an account of judgment and taste to include the sexual sense is to draw attention to the issue of conviction when Bentham observes that it's simply tautologous to say that to every man that which is his own taste is the best taste, he's restating Kant's observation that everyone thinks that everyone else should share their taste. But he's extending judgments of taste to include the pleasures of the sixth sense of sex so as to secure them against erosion. In the case of the fine arts, when the object is of a complex nature, he writes, by being made to observe this or that circumstance which he had not observed before, <coughs> this or that feature of def or defect of excellence, which till now had passed unobserved, a man may now and then be made to change his taste. But in the field of appetite, of taste considered in that respect, of physical appetite, so simple is the object, no place can be found for any such discovery. People continue to have sex, albeit with greater and lesser frequency at different stages of their lives, because sexual experience is so intensely pleasurable that they are willing to risk all manner of trouble and inconvenience in pursuit of it. Sexual pleasure in its various forms, and particularly in the form of sex between men, is for him an unambiguous pleasure. The particular form that one individual sexual pleasure uh, takes is also, as B Bentham realizes, so far from being communicable that it makes sense for him to recount a story from Lucian in which a young man is so enamored of a statue of Venus that he had sex with it not by following prescribed heterosexual practices, but by having sex with a part which is common to both sexes. People do not, in Bentham's account, have regular or irregular sex because they've been educated by other people's examples. The education of the senses, the education from the senses, begins, however, when the priests from Bentham's conjectural history treat other people's pleasures as a currency they can traffic in. The idea of a god or gods creates priests in the form of those who claim to be able to interpret the wishes of a supersensible being. <clears throat>
the priestly form of social precedence, um, their authority establishes the asceticism, that's asceticism and not aestheticism, the asceticism principle, as it confiscates the pleasures of others by offering those pleasures up in sacrifice, a sacrifice meaningful because painful, and painful because it involves foregoing of pleasure. In Bentham's version of a discourse on the origin of inequality, conducted as a discussion of sexuality and pleasure, the ascetic principle of priestly authority has its purchase because it authorizes a similar pattern of behavior among the faithful. The Kantian account of aesthetic judgment revolved around encouraging individuals to trust their own judgment, but Bentham's account of aesthetic judgment includes estimations of both sexuality and opinion. Social, political, and religious precedents mystify insofar as they destroy distract individuals into distrusting and calumniating, cal calumniating sorry, other people's judgments. In Bentham's view, the doctrine of the original sin itself feeds into this pattern of despotic asceticism. As continually ratified in the service of the Church of England, it traffics in a market of pleasures and pain by allowing individuals to purchase indulgences for the price of a few mere words of disparagement of others. All men are sinners, yet some are saved, therefore without prejudice to salvation, a certain quality of sin, quantity of sin may always be committed. Bentham writes in paraphrase of the position he takes to be the church position. At so cheap a price as that of a few words, he says, one may acquire the reputation of the love, the ardent love of virtue. This social transaction has its analog in the supposedly soul-saving act of imagining that uh, any sinfulness in one's own pleasures may be washed away by making the pleasures of others look damnable. Bentham aptly quotes Samuel Butler, Butler's Hudibras here on the technique of compo compounding for sins they are inclined to by damning those they have no mind to. Now, as Bentham lays out the various kinds of sexual behavior that have been made punishable by death, he doesn't avail himself of the most direct challenge to the legitimacy of the laws. He doesn't say by whose authority or who says so. He doesn't avail himself of the tactics Saad made use of. Though he indicts the laws governing <coughs> sexuality and indicts them of absurdity, his most stunning argument is that Christian script scriptural teaching is there to be affirmed, that it only need to be, needs to be recovered from the texts that surround it and obscure it. The writings of the Hebrew Bible, the Christian Gospels, and the letters of St. Paul may all be bound together in one volume and make up, m look as though they make up one composite text. They are all, he recognizes, legislative prompts to behavior that operate in the name of Christianity. But in fact, they prompt all manner of different behaviors. For practically any action, one could find a portion of the scripture, the scripture that would be glossed by, the Bible tells me so. Bentham's approach, like that of Spinoza in the Tractatus Theologico-Politicus, is to sift the scriptures and perform a crucial act of philological criticism. He argues that the ascetic principle, enunciated, affirmed, and reaffirmed by Moses, John the Baptist, and Paul, has no legitimacy in the face of the statements that the Gospels make about Jesus and attribute to him. Moses and Paul may have legislated, legislated minutely, minutely to condemn sex between men and varieties of sex between men and women, but Jesus did not. And Bentham, without a Sadian sneer, treats Jesus' scheme of instruction as evidenced in his words and his deeds as authoritative for the Christians among whom Bentham lived. Jesus formed his teachings as an explicit repudiation of Mosaic law, and the Gospels demonstrate that that repudiation extended to sexuality. Not only did Jesus not castigate other people's sexualities, the Gospels attest to his own sexual relations with men and with women. <clears throat>
What seems to me most remarkable about Bentham's line of argument here is how thoroughly he detaches it from his own religious beliefs, or rather his a lack of religious belief or his beliefs that were anta antagonistic to religion. Instead, he focuses on identifying the best version of other people's beliefs on the beliefs or the beliefs that they can and should lay claim to. The legislation of Jesus, the legislation of the Gospels, is what British Christians should keep before them. And any backsliding into the viciousness of Moses or Paul and the principle of asceticism should be arrested when they consider who they are, what their name is. Jesus may have replaced the law of Moses, but Paul did not replace Jesus and instead corrupted his teaching, to use one of Joseph Priestley's consistent phrases. Um, Bentham may see the congruence between Jesus' teachings and the principle of utilitar ut utility, but he's not asking his fellow Britons to subscribe to utilitarianism in his name. He's saying, above all else, that the very name of their religion, Christianity, contributes an ongoing affirmation of Jesus' claim to preeminence as a guide to their thought and behavior. They are not Paulist, but Christians. The principle of asceticism may have been honored in long-standing practice, but the continuing embrace of the name of Christians <coughs> counts as a principle of principles. Thank you very much. Okay. Are there other questions? Mm -hmm.